You want to change it up? Yeah. Questions? Questions? Sure. Um, in the Bible, it talks about how Jesus baptized some people with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues. Do you need to speak in tongues to know that you've been loved? All right. All right. Good question. Straight out of the gate. I like it like that. I don't like dancing around. I just like it. Now, your specific question, let's go into it. What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What is it? What does baptize mean? Huh? What does, it mean, what does it mean to be baptized? What is, does anybody know the literal? What? Who said it? Immersed. That's good. Immersed. The word baptized means to be immersed, to sink. R? R? Yeah. I never claim to be a speller. R? S? Okay. Got the rest on my own. <laughs> immersed. It means to be uh, sunk. Like if they, they would say in, in, in the writings that if a, si a ship sank in the ocean, it would be baptized. It would be immersed. So apply that. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Immersed in the Holy Spirit. Like if you were swimming in it. As in like, it's all around you. It's in you. It's through you. It's like you can't get away from it. It permeates every f fiber of your being and your soul and your mind that you are immersed. Okay? Now I think this is really interesting. Someone please turn... Uh, in the Gospels, to when Je oh my gosh, I forgot it. What is it, Meldrick? When he's in synagogue and he rolls the scroll out and he reads Isaiah 61. Anybody know the reference? The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel and good tidings to the poor, to heal the blind, the sick, the lame, the leper. Anybody know where he says that in the Gospels? It just oh, I lost it. Okay. Search. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. I know it's Isaiah 61, but Jesus quotes it. My web search turned us up. So we can go to Isaiah 61 in our Bibles, and it'll have a chain reference to the, where it says in the gospel. Hey, why don't, why don't you do that for me, Mel? Find, find that verse. Okay, so Jesus is in the scroll. Jesus is in the synagogue. What is it? Matthew 11, 5, right on. So Jesus is in the synagogue, and I'm going to answer your question. I just like to get around to it my way. So Jesus is in the synagogue, and he rolls out the scroll. And he, what is it? And the first thing he says publicly, not true, publicly as in for as a teacher position in the synagogue, as a teacher, this is what Jesus wants to say, is the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Okay. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. So Jesus was immersed in this Spirit. We know this ultimately and fully. Can you move your bag so I can do the gauntlet? Um, in Revelation it says Jesus has the sevenfold Spirit. And you're like, what? Right? You're like, what is the sevenfold Spirit? Have you seen that in Revelation? It's in there. It's in Revelation, second and third chapter. Jesus is the sevenfold spirit. See, so like, what does that mean? What does it mean? Well, if you, if you know the scriptures in Isaiah in the 11th chapter, it gives you all seven. Why don't, why don't, Quentin, why don't you turn for me in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, 11, just go through all the seven spirits. Yeah. 
Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That's nuts, right? Gives you all seven right there. It's a good little lesson for you. So in describing Jesus, he's described as one with the sevenfold spirit of God. Now, don't get, don't get too caught up on the numbers. Seven is just a number of completion or fullness. So basically, Jesus walked in the fullness of God's spirit. That's the real nugget behind it. That Jesus walked in the fullness of God's spirit. And this is a spiritual principle that you can take to the bank. Everything that Jesus had, he wants to give to you. Jesus wants to give you everything that he has. Everything. Jesus wants you to walk in all fullness just as he walked in all fullness. Jesus wants you to take upon his purpose, his plan, his method, his power. Jesus believes in you more than you believe in yourself. Jesus says, greater works will you do now that I go to be with my Father. And he means that and he believes that. And it's up to our job to walk in obedience and trust and love to make sure that that's true. So Jesus wants us to walk in the same fullness of God, the same fullness of His Spirit that He had. So is that, that's, a, that's a good general premise to start into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit also is the fulfillment of Je Jesus' promise to us. Not only the promise of Him, but the promise of His Father. Let's go to the end of Luke. Do you know it yet? The railroad? <laughs> we put a bunch of Monopoly verses on the, the... We put a bunch of Bible verses on the Monopoly game, and we're trying to learn a lot of them, but that's one of them. So at the end of Luke... Now, last words are important, aren't they? Yeah. Let's look at some of the last words recorded in the Gospel of Luke. And that's another study if you want to do is study the last words of Jesus. It's pretty incredible. I would give them to you now, but we don't have a lot of time. Let's go to verse 49. Behold... Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until what? Until you are endued with power from on high. Wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high, until you are endued with power. Jesus says, wait until you receive power from on high. So Jesus had given us the task, right? He had commissioned us to go and make what? Of all nations, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's the mission. That's what we're called to do. That's, how, that's his last words in Matthew, is make disciples. His last words in Mark are preach the gospel. His last words in Luke are receive the promise of the Father. And the last words in John show the duration till I return. So it shows you what we're to do. That we're supposed to make disciples, preach the gospel. But this is the essential element, the indispensable requirement. Uh, you cannot preach the gospel, you cannot make disciples until you receive power from on high. That the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of God, is the power to do what He asks us to do. It's the gas in the car. And so you can try to do it without it but it'll be the work of the flesh. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because Jesus w wants us to walk in the fullness of God and rely on Him. Because Jesus tells Him to wait. Jesus t waits, tells Him to wait until you receive. Mm -hmm. All right. So to answer your question specifically, you said, do you have to what now? I want to... Do you have to speak in tongues? Okay, so people always talk about tongues. 
And I'll get into that. I'll talk about that. I think that's important. But the point is not tongues. The point is what? Power. Power. The word there is dynamite. It's where we get the word dynamite. Pretty nuts. Dunamis. Dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. Dynamite. That's what he's talking about here. You shall receive power. The dynamite power of God. That when this goes off in your life, it's going to be an explosion. Everyone's going to see it. It's going to be a riot. You're going to turn cities upside down. These men who have turned the world upside down, as the scripture said, have come here also. Isn't that nuts? The scriptures say that. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. That the whole city of Ephesus went up against the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Can you imagine an entire city being against one man? And he just leaves churches in his wakes. He's walking through and there's just, oh, there's a church there. There's a church there. We'll have a church tomorrow. Power. Power of God. So it's always important not to focus on the wrong part of the story. You know what I'm saying? So people are like, oh, tongues. But it's about power. It's the power of God in your life. It's the fullness of God in your life. So let, let that being said, you know, there's great men of God that experienced this. George Fox, William Booth, oh my, Charles Finney. There's a... Just are some of our heroes that they, when the Holy Spirit, the, when the baptism of the Spirit came on their heart, they experienced the power of God. Okay. Power to what? Not for independent personal power to show how great you are that you've reached level 13 Jedi or whatever, whatever y'all do nowadays. But it's power to witness. It's power to witness. It's power to witness. And they overcame the devil by the, the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. That in order to do this effectively in the fullness that God wants from you, you need the power to witness. And you shall receive power to be my witnesses. You see what I'm saying? So there's a great article if you want further research. It's called Power Needed. Power Needed by uh, Winky Pratney. Power Needed. Okay. i got to get going faster. Okay. So in the biblical record, what goes on when this happens? Um, there's fire comes upon the people. Uh, there's also tongues spoken. So let's go to Acts chapter verse Acts chapter two, verse four. Shemira, will you read it for me, please? So this is where? Where is this in the Bible? This is Acts chapter 2. This is the birth of the early church. This is, they are doing what Jesus told them to do. Wait and where until you receive power from on high. So they're in Jerusalem waiting, being obedient to Jesus. And when they were obedient to Jesus, the Holy Spirit came upon them like a mighty rushing wind. 120 men were filled in the upper room. 
and women were filled with God in the upper room. There was a mighty wind that shook the building and flames of fire came on their head and they all spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance and they spilled out into the temple and they went into the temple and they're all in the fullness of God and the, the Apostle Peter who was a coward a day later stands up and with all power and all authority says, you with wicked hands have crucified the Lord of glory and 3,000 people get saved and baptized probably in the temple in the temple priest baptism pool. Pretty nuts, right? In one day. Always be obedient to Jesus. <laughs> Unqualified fishermen. Unqualified nobodies. But in the power of God, in the fullness of His Spirit, kings of the earth, queens of the earth. There was a great story. There was a man who was secretary to the king of England. To the king of England, he was the secretary. And one day, one day, the king was waiting. His secretary wasn't there. He was holding up the king. He didn't show up to work. And he comes in six hours late, soaking wet in the rain. Where have you been, John? I'm sorry, sir. There was a man in the south of Louis, and the Spirit of God was upon him. And I had to watch him preach. This man held up the King of England to watch George Whitfield. Can you understand what I just said? That's punishable. I don't know if it's even punishable by, that, by death. I imagine it might be, and then. He's like, ah, sorry, King. <laughs> the man, that man over there. He's full of the Spirit of God. That's incredible to me. I love that story. So evidence of this. Acts 2. This is Pentecostal sermon. Okay. Sorry. So this happens. This is incredible. It happens to the enemies of God. The Samaritans were the enemies of God, the unclean ones. You know, the ones who forfeited God's promises. I thank you, God, that I'm not a Samaritan. That's what they used to pray. I'd rather, I'd rather eat the flesh of a pig than break bread with a Samaritan. And God shows that there's no racism, there's no division, there's, no, there's just people. And the kingdom of God is in the hearts of men. And the Holy Spirit fills these people too. Anybody who repents and puts their trust in Jesus Christ, the God can fill them with their Holy Spirit and wants to and waits to. Nuts, right? So it happens in the Samaria again with the same evidences. And people always say, does it have to be tongues? Does it have to be tongues? You can sum up the entire Pentecostal experience. You can sum up the entire movement and spirit of God on God's people in one word. More. More. You should always say more. You should always tell Jesus more. Because the moment you say, I want it this way in this box that I have created, you limit the spirit of God in your life. That is, I'm never telling you to go outside what is written. I am the it is written guy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like if there's, a, if, there's a, if, if there's a strength, like I don't lean on the spiritual side. I lean on the it is written side, which and everybody has their proclivity. But that being said, allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life. Don't say, oh, okay, I don't want that. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Cool. So it happens, in, it happens in the Pentecostal sermon. It happens in Acts chapter 8. Uh, it happens to Paul. <laughs> right? Oh, and this one, is, this one is the killer for them. Not them. God's Spirit falls on the Gentiles. And this begins to freak Peter out. It begins to... Have you all remember the vision, the cloth, with all the animals? 
Peter's like, oh, what do I do? I can't, I can't, I can't minister to these people. Because you're not allowed to be with them. How would you like to go sit with the Al-Qaeda's? That's what it means. The enemies, the, the outsiders, the unclean ones. When you're a little boy, the rabbis hurry you along when they walk by so you don't touch them. Nuts, right? But God's Holy Spirit falls on them too. And then Peter has this vision and there's all these animals and P God's, God basically tells Peter, what I have called clean, you do not call unclean. And Peter's like, okay. He walks into the centurion's house. He preaches the gospel. He doesn't even get to the first point. Literally, he's, preach he's like, Jesus came to save sinners. And they're just like, oh. <laughs> and they fall down and they worship him and they speak in tongues and they get filled with the Holy Spirit and there's glory and power all in the room. Yeah, that's what happens. Because Peter didn't go, I want it this way in this box. But Lord, you move in my life the more. Whatever you want. You do it. You see what I'm saying? Because like, I'll talk about the picture. Sometimes when you hold up that little thing to him, it's a joke. When you're like, God, I want you to move this way in my life, it's a joke to him. Because his plan for you is like, if you could... Put like a line all the way from like Costco all the way to like El Paso is what he wants. You see what I'm saying? So you just got to come with a heart of expectancy to say, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do. Whatever you want, I'll do. Okay. This happens again in Ephesus. Do y'all want a whole bunch of Bible verses or no? No, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I just want to know what you want. I want to, I want to, I want to help you all to. So your question is, do they, have to, do they have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Is that what you're asking? Okay. Well, tongues are the biblical evidence for the speaking of tongues. Uh, I said that wrong. Tongues is the biblical evidence for this. When people get, experience this in the Bible, there's five times where it specifically says they were filled or baptized with the Holy Ghost. And four out of those five times, tongues is mentioned. The other time when it's not mentioned, you're like, oh, what about that time? Well, that's a time when there's a sorcerer. <laughs> and he tries to do what when the, they, people receive the Holy Spirit? Peter, yeah. He's with P he tries to buy the power from Peter. It's like, how much money do I have to pay you so you can teach me that trick? Because I've been in the occult my entire life studying all of these expensive things and have never had the smidgen of the power that you, you dumb fish hook fishermen have. So he tries to buy it. What does Peter say to him? Let your money die with you. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's a lot different than hey, he's got a wonderful plan for your life, right? <laughs> Let your money die with you. So my question is, and in this story, what did the sorcerer see that compelled him to purchase, to try to purchase it? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. There, if the Holy Spirit was just like, oh, I received it. That's what no sorcerer is going to be, no. But if it's all like, bam, power, glory, and people are like, getting, you know, it's just... There's weeping and yelling and jumping, but then there's just like, you know, serenity and holiness, and people are just like, you see what I'm saying? What did that sorcerer want? So that goes into my next thing. Does it always look the same for every person? I think the evidences remain the same, but the outworkings are always different. Sometimes when people get filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized with the Holy Spirit, it's like a hurricane. <laughs> they get hit and they're just like, boom. And they, you know, they go nuts. And then sometimes it's like the dew. You can't even tell when it came, but you know it's here. It's like that. It just depends. You see what I'm saying? So, but the most important, the most important part of all this is that we have a yielded heart to God. And that we're able to say to Him in faith more. And this is... Dr. Tozer, who is a man deeply filled with the Spirit of God, says, 
In order to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you must have faith that He will. You must have faith that He will fill you. So many people do not receive the fullness of God because they don't walk in faith. Does that make sense? Hebrews 11.6, do you know it yet? Do you know it yet? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to him must realize that he is, and that he is a what? He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.6 So yeah, there's... The evidence, so the answer to your question is straightforward. I believe, yes, when people do get baptized with the Holy Spirit, the evidence, the evidence of that is speaking in tongues, I believe. And also prophesy. And also uh, the, the glory. And as Leonard Ravenhill says, the only evidence of the Holy Ghost in your life is a holy life. And, and I'm on the holiness stream too. I think... You know, there's no point. If you think you, you know, speak in tongues and walk in sin, you can't put those two together. I'm sorry. You're just fooling yourself. Yes, question. I was just curious. But do you, do you ever think that uh, speaking in tongues can almost, like, say that person kind of measure their distance from God? Okay, so this is a, this is an important thing. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are never badges of honor. They're never points of arrival. The whole point of this is power to witness, power to serve, power to serve, and power to build each other up for the manifestation of the Spirit of God in your life. This is Paul. The manifestation of the Spirit of God is for the benefit of the body. Always write this, benefit to the body, edification to the body. Whether that body be personal or corporate, the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit is to build, edify, and uplift the body. Whether that be personal or corporate. Now, what do I mean by personal? Personal, the body. You know, the, the, your spirit, your inner man. In the, in the epistle of Jude, it says, praying in the Holy Ghost, building yourself up, praying in the Holy Spirit, that it'll build up your inner man, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's in Jude. So that praying in the Spirit builds up the inner man. Now, what is it, what, what is it, what's praying in the Spirit? Praying in the Spirit. What does that mean? The Apostle Paul says in the letter of Corinthians that if I speak in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Did you know that? That's what Apostle Paul says. If I speak in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Now go to the brother of Je Jesus, Jude. He who, you know, an un he who you know, speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. So that you can, put, you can speak. So speaking in tongues, praying in the spirit are synonymous in the scriptures. You got that? They are equal to each other. So write that down. That's important. Praying in the Spirit and speaking in tongues is one and the same. Three different ways from the Apostle Paul. If you need them, I can write them out. But i got a lot of stuff to cover and this always brings questions. So and the thing is, this is not, uh, to me, it's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Paul says, I, I thank God that I do this more than all of you. And he's not bragging. He's just so grateful for it. And when you realize that this is a, a way to influence your intimacy with God, that it'll build up your intimacy with God, that, that you know, as Paul says in Romans in the 8th chapter, sometimes I don't know how to pray as I ought. But the Spirit makes intercession for me according to the perfect will of God. And, and groanings and utterings that can't be articulated. Isn't that nuts? That's Romans in the 8th chapter. So, I'll tell you a story. I, read it, I was read, reading a story. There's this Baptist pastor on the East Coast who doesn't believe in any of this. But you know what happened to him? His best friend's daughter, 13 years old, was hit in a car. And they're like, get here. She has 40 minutes to live. So, he, he flew down the highway. He gets to the hospital. She has hemorrhaging in her brain. 
they, they have her in an oxygen tent. They have her all strapped down. She's in seizures. And he's like, God, I don't know what to do. And he's broken. He's, he's dying inside. And they all look to him because he's the pastor. He's the man of God. He's the one that's always told them that, you know, whatever happens. And so he's dying. He's dying inside. And it was an amazing thing because you know what God spoke to him? Romans in the 8th chapter, verse 26. So he doesn't, he's like, I don't know how to pray. God, I don't know how to pray right now. But he reaches out and he grabs her hand. And in, in, his, in his mumblings and his fumblings, he just said, Spirit God, somehow pray through me. Pray exactly what needs to be prayed right now because I got nothing. I'm dying here. And, and, and the Holy Spirit began to pray through him. And her leg moved. And she wasn't brain dead. And she recovered. That's a crazy story, right? And this is for a man who doesn't believe anything, but had, was desperate for God to move. That he waited for God to move. He, they waited. Wait until Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Power to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Wait. So let's talk about sometimes why the Holy Spirit doesn't come. Right? Some of you are like, well, I prayed and nothing happened. Well, the scriptures say the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And I think one of the greatest ways to bring the Holy Spirit and the fullness of God in your heart and life is to glorify Jesus. That's what happened to me. I didn't even know about it. <laughs> I didn't know anything from anything when, I, when it happened to me. I, I, you look at me now, you're like, oh, what a Bible scholar. No, I was looking in for John and Genesis and, you know, and I didn't know anything. I thought I broke my brain when I was praying because all I was saying is Jesus you're beautiful Jesus I love you I was in my room alone there's nobody was praying for me I didn't know anything about anything and all of a sudden this fullness of God came in my heart and I I realized I I had been going for 30 minutes and I wasn't even speaking English anymore and I was like I think I've read about this <laughs> I, but the beautiful part about it is it wasn't this weird obscure experience it was more the same God I already knew more of the same God you already know. And as David Wilkerson says, this power, this experience makes Jesus real to you and known to others. Real to you and known to others. Well, my, one of my dear friends, Eli Stewart, he, he told me something one, one time, and I thought it was, it was like someone dropped a, a gold nugget in my pan. I was like, it did. I was like, whoa. Well, people always talk about, you know, the speaking of tongues parts, right? You know, they always talk about the talking part. Okay. You know, the talking part. And then he started talking about the way God looks at it. And then it expanded my, like someone pulled back the heavens on my heart. Because if anyone who had a rough life, Eli did. If anybody's been misinterpreted, it probably was Eli. But he goes, Kyle, God always interprets me correctly. God all. Because, you know, sometimes you have these things, these, these gushings in your heart, and you pour out your heart to God, and it doesn't make any sense, but it makes sense to Him. Mm -hmm. And so people always talk about the speaking part of tongues, but I think the real beauty lies in the interpretation that God always interprets you rightly. He always knows what's going on in here. He always is able to, to interpret what's really going on, what you're really trying to say. Because Paul calls this the inexpressible gift. The inexpressible gift. 2 Corinthians 9.15. The, the inability to express it. Dr. P.C. Nelson, in, in regards to Romans 8.26, uh, says that, that these groanings cannot be uttered in articulate speech. That there, is a, that there is a limit to our vocabulary. And my brother, who is a genius, 
sitting at 147 on the Mensa IQ. <laughs> He's, oh my gosh, I was made with spare parts. <laughs> my brother says it's more the same God you already know. And in all the languages of all the tribes and all the tongues of people, if you try to talk about all their words, every word put together would not be enough to describe the grandeur and majesty of our king. Trust me now. It wouldn't be enough. Every language known to man added together, all vocabulary words stacked high, it would not be enough to express who he is and what he's done. Okay. So we talked about a lot of stuff. That's a big topic. Oh, let's talk about this. Some of the hindrances of not receiving it is ingratitude. It's in gratitude. Yeah, for sure. I've seen the Holy Spirit just come in a room and just, just move. And it, you know how it usually happens? It usually happens when Slink, you tell Ryan how thankful you are for him. That's when it usually happens. When, when, it, when he comes, he usually follows the gratitude. I don't know why. It's a spiritual thing. But thanks, you know, a, a thankful heart prepares the way of the Lord. That enter into His presence, into His gates with what? With thanksgiving. And it seems to be the spiritual reality that when we have gratitude for one another, the Holy Spirit begins to move and feels free because He feels welcome. He's, we're no longer backbiting and fault finding. But you see, anyone see that? No? Okay, well, I see it. Well, maybe one day. <coughs> So edification of the body. Building up oneself. Remember, personally, it's in Jude. And then corporately. You know, now remember, now we'll get into this in another session. Personal tongues and corporate tongues is apples and oranges. Two separate things. And people get in a lot of confusion when they compare the two. Does that make sense? No. Okay, well, we'll get into it. We're getting, so if someone goes off in a corporate setting and, and speaks in an ecstatic utterance of tongues for the manifestation and edification of the body, that's a corporate sense. And that's different than personal edification. Personal edification is private. Does that make sense? It's personal. It's private. It's between you and God. He'll interpret you correctly. But corporate for the body of Christ, that's separate. That's, but both are great. Both have their... You know. Okay. So we hit this. We hit this. Hit this. Oh, okay. This goes into this. How many of you remember the story of Babel? Yeah. What happens? Uh, hold on. Anybody? What happens in Babel? Um, they were building a, a city and God told them so they're trying to build a city, they're trying to build a kingdom, and they're all of one language, but are they trying to get to God? In a sense, but they're trying to get their way, how they want it. Because Bab means gate, El means God. They're trying to build a gate to God, but their way, through the work of their own hand. And God never allows you to get to Him through the work of his, your own hand. The story of Cain and Abel. Cain tried to get there, but I'm a, you know, I'm a farmer. Here's my goods. I made these. Abel had to look to the another. You can never get to God by the work of your own hand. So Babel, they're trying to get to God by the work of their own hand. And God comes down and confuses their languages. They're trying to build a kingdom. They're trying to do it their way. And God confuses them. Anybody see it yet? Take Babel and take Pentecost and put them next to each other. Babel, he confuses their languages. He spreads them out. They're trying to get their way. Pentecost, he somehow unites them because Peter's going off. He's preaching. He's preaching his spirit. And people hear him in Arabic and Scythian and Greek and Mede and they all get saved from all these different tribes. And they're trying to build not their own kingdom, but whose kingdom? The Lord's. So it's a beautiful... 
type and anti-type. It's a beautiful, like, double-sided lesson there. I don't know. It's worth, worth a lot to me, personally. And the, the crazy part about this is that, this, that, that, that the guy who found that was a man named William Seymour, which he had one eye. Funny, right? <laughs> William Seymour was a little black man in Houston. Could barely read. Started, he, he started, through the Lord's help, the largest mission-sending agency in the history of the church. Nuts, right? Reaching the nations. That's what their goal, to reach the nations. Send missionaries to every tribe, tongue, and nation. It's beautiful, I think. It's just absolutely beautiful. Okay. Another question. I've been talking a lot. Question. Anybody? Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, be baptized both ways. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, there's the water baptism and the spirit baptism. It's, yeah. Does it matter in what order they receive, like, they receive, like, if you get... You know, there's a biblical order to be baptized in water first and then receive the spirit, Holy Spirit, to get laying on of hands, Paul says. Yeah? Um, when you, like, speak in tongues corporately... Like group, yeah. Will there be a trans- or will There should always be an interpretation. If, and somebody, if, if there is no interpretation, the speaker must interpret the Bible says in Corinthian letter. So there should always. So, you, so if that ever happens in a corporate sense in Chi Alpha, we wait for the interpretation, because we believe that God's ministering through His Spirit to the body. It's corporate edification, not personal edification, but corporate. God has a word to the body. Yes, ma'am. And then you, huh? Oh, that's a good question. So in Acts chapter 2, they received and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then persecution came. James is killed and they all get scared for their lives and they have to do what? In the fourth chapter, they get filled again and the room is shaken. So the beautiful part about it, and, and that's a good, thank you for asking that question because it inspired me to hear the difference between this. Now as a Christian, as a born again follower of Christ, the Bible says in the Ephesian letter that you are sealed by the Spirit of God. That means God seals you. He puts His mark of ownership on you. Just like a, a king would put a, a seal on a, a, on a mandate or a, uh, on a, a letter of significance. He would, put his, he would drip wax on it and then he'd put his king ring, his signet ring in it, right? Yeah. And that's the seal of ownership. This bears the weight and authority of the king. So Jesus says he does this for us, that he puts that mark and impression in your heart and seals you saying, you bear my mark, you bear my authority. If anybody messes with you, they mess with me. Pretty neat, right? So that's for all believers, all Christians. But to those same people in the same letter, Apostle Paul says, be filled with the Spirit of God. And that filled is in the present continuous tense. That not a one-time filling, but a constant, ongoing filling of the Spirit of God. He who believes in me, as the Scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. A well. He who believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John in the 7th chapter. Jesus spake concerning the Spirit. the next one. <laughs> so is it necessary to be refilled later? Sure. Absolutely. Don't you want to be? <laughs> I do. I want more of God. More! That's the word. If you don't remember anything else today. More. 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 Oh, you have a question? Yeah, well, we're going to have a whole session on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We'll have a whole, we'll have a whole session on that. So. But remember, personal edification, per, personal but uplifting and corporate uplifting. Two separate things. Anybody got another question? Let me get a warm up. You got anything? Yeah. Anything to say? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so Hoover says... Uh, 
also he believes that uh, science isn't the only way to prove evidence. Uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's good. That's right on. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you? No, no. Oh, so yeah, so it's, 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 it's that and. Yeah, because one time they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And we'll get into what prophecy is on the, the day when we talk about the Spirit. We're going to do that, right? Does anyone have the syllabus out? I'm sure we are. Walking in the Spirit, yeah, sure. Yeah, cool. So we'll get into the corporate and personal distinctions and all the gifts and the fruit and that kind of stuff. Anybody else have any questions on this? Yeah. What are the steps? Oh, that's a good question. The steps. If, if you, if you want uh, personal bios, read this book and this book. If you want steps, this book, this book, and this book gives you a step-by-step -step basis. This one has a really strong step in it. I wish I got them. If you want, do y'all want them? Yeah. Number one thing is to have faith, right? In order to, in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you've got to have the faith that He will do what He says. And He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's what it says. Now, I'll think about it. He what? He will. He will. <laughs> so the first one is obviously to be a Christian. <laughs> Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Number two is to re renounce all sin. You know, you, a divided heart, not happening. The, renounce all sin in life. Step three is to make an open confession before the world. And that usually is in baptism. When baptism is a public confession to everyone that I, I'm the, I belong to Jesus Christ. And I'm, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine, and I'm buried with him in baptism. Step four is to walk in obedience to what you know to be true. Step number five is to thirst. And then step number six is just to ask him. Just ask him. There's a scripture Jesus talks about regarding the Holy Spirit that if if, you're, if, your earthly if you asked your earthly father for a piece of bread, would he give you a stone? If you asked him for, if you asked, if you asked him for an egg, would he give you a, a, a scorpion? And then Jesus says, you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more? How much more should your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? So Jesus... Tells us to wait till we receive power from on high. But power to what? Witness. Power to witness. Power to serve. It's not elevation of oneself. It's bowing the knee. It's in service. It's in service. Gratitude. Gratitude. And glorification of Jesus. That's how I usually see it come. If you want the Holy Spirit, do the steps, be in gratitude, and glorify His name. Yeah? Is this like a, a key thing to be able to like, Yeah, well, why would... Now, that's a good question. Do we let people be small group leaders if they haven't? Obviously, we, we understand that God has a timetable for your life. And, but on the same token, as your pastor, as your leader... I tell you, you need this. We need this. I need this. We all need this. I need this every morning. You understand know what I'm saying? Yeah. I couldn't do what I do without this. You see what I'm saying? None of us could. We'll all testify that, that this is the, the power behind everything. I believe that. We talk, about, we talk about fellowship, we talk about discipleship. You can't have true fellowship, you can't have true discipleship without the Spirit of God, for He's the di divine director of operations, Winky Pratney says. He's the power behind it all. And you guys have experienced, you, you're living in this, 
in this world, and I'm here to tell you the, the reality behind it, the power behind it is the Spirit of God in, his li in the lives of faithful believers. That's the reality of what's going on. And it is compelling and beautiful and attractive. And that's one thing about the Holy Spirit is He's not weird. For the Bible calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Christ. It's just Jesus. You know what I mean? It's not weird. It's beautiful. He's beautiful. Any other questions? Come on, this one always asks questions. Sure, yeah. And don't be afraid. Questions are good. Learners, right? We're all learners. I'm a learner. Mm -hmm. I learned something this morning. When I read that article, I was like, oh my gosh, her leg moved when he grabbed her hand. Okay, anyways. <laughs> So what's the question? Like, is it possible for someone like... Are we talking about corporate? Yeah. Oh, so someone is in deceiving themselves or something? Yeah. Like okay, so that's, that's a good question. The Bible says uh, that by your fruits you shall know them. And, and Jesus says, when you judge, use righteous judgment. So n nothing happening in the corporate sense is ever going to go outside the realm of Scripture. It never can. Does that make sense? If it does... Pfft, I'm there. I'll be like, ah, 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 it is written, thus saith, you know, you know, here comes Obadiah to save the day. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So every, uh, a, a corporate message will always be in the, in the, in the, cha ooh, in the channels of Scripture. See, I was outside the channels, and that was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so what about personal? She's going to go. She got, she, I want her to ask questions. What happens if uh, nobody interprets it and you're just standing there? Then we wait. wait until yeah, and then it's, then it's up to the... Well, it's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Because people are like, oh, no, what's going to happen? God is in control, people. You know what I'm saying? And he, we want him to speak to us. And, oh, you want to hear a story? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> now, I don't, like, like, if, like, my spiritual gifts are not at those. I can walk right up to you and be like, hey, dude, you need to get right with your dad. And I can do that like night and day, all day long, all day long, call it out. That's just what I got. I don't got the other spiritual ones. I have laid hands on a stick a hundred times. Nothing happens. <laughs> you know? But Sam's sister, he's just like, oh, let me, let me just touch you a little bit. And they get, you, know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just everyone in, everybody ministers according to the gift that God gives them. But to answer your question, what was the question? I had a threat. <laughs> no, 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 I had it. It's here. Hold on. Give me a second. Okay. What? Huh? A story. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I was in a church and someone, I was in a church and there was a, a corporate message went out in tongues and I, and I understood it, but I didn't have the courage and I've never understood it since. I, I don't, can't explain that theologically because theologically I think it might come back later, but I've always wondered about that. Did somebody else do it then? Though? Yeah, okay. and it was exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I didn't have the courage because I was young. I was like, I don't belong here. All these people are amazing. I have dreadlocks. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm wearing shoes right now. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, but... But it's for, the whole point of it is not to be how amazed, but it's to serve and to edify and build up the body. And people need this. People need you to walk in the fullness of God. People need you to walk in the power of God. This campus needs you to walk in everything that God has for you. And remember, it's just more. More of the same God you already know. Any other? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Paul says, I thank God I do it more than all of you. I, uh, I would always be cautious of who's in the group, you know. And, uh, but th well, sure, that, that's, that's fun. That's fine. That's good. It's, it's personal, you know. And, but, uh, you know, Paul says, I, I pray in the Spirit. I sing in the Spirit. You know, you know, I have a melody in my heart. And so that's okay. That's wonderful. Uh, no, but, but the, the, part of, the part about it is you should always take into consideration let every man consider others better. You know, you always are looking out for each other. You're always in the best interest for each other and the group. And if you're worried about, well, I need to get my spiritual refreshment. I need to get my... No, that's not the way. Because you always should be concerned about who? Him and then him in that order. Him, you, then you. 
Does that make sense? Okay, no, yes? Yes, Drea. Um, you said that the, the people waited So that's a good question. In the Old Testament, it would say the Spirit of God came upon them. And, and that even happened to disciples. Jesus says, uh, Jesus says uh, receive the Holy Spirit like it came upon them even before the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. But to be filled, to be baptized, is separate and distinct from the Old Testament pattern of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon them. Okay? So the, in the Old Testament, it was, a, it, was a, uh, it, was on the out, it was on the outside and it was there, but it could also depart. Whereas in the New Testament, it seems to be this continuous experience, this constant refreshing. He who believes in me... As the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Present continuous tense. Be filled. Be filled. Filled. Like all the way, all the way. Like a well. Yes, ma'am. Mm hmm. Scriptures say in the book of Hebrews that he makes his ministers as flames of fire. John Wesley said, I set myself on fire and the world watches me burn. And it's true. I mean, there were thousands and thousands of people would come and listen to him. Only after a week of getting kicked out of churches. But that's funny. I was reading this di diary the other day, and it was like, week one, kicked out of St. James. Week two, getting kicked out of this place. Kicked out, kicked out, kicked out. They set a bull loose in his congregation once. But yeah. <laughs> Elders met together and decided that it wasn't best for their congregation. And then the last one is like, had a, had a, meeting, had a meeting in a pasture today. 10,000 people came. But, and do you know what his symbol was? Do you know what they would, that, the pamphlets they would hang out? It was this giant cross. And there would be these huge two, there would be these giant flames on it. Divided flames of fire. And that's the symbol of the Pentecostal experience in Acts chapter 2. Which is also found in the Old Testament where it says the voice of the Lord is as divided flames of fire. When I found that one, I was so excited. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anybody else have any questions? Paul, uh, Paul in Corinthians speaks of uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so that's, yeah, so Paul Gapsley gives a hierarchy of the spiritual gifts, and he says, er earnestly desire the greater gifts that thou prophesy, and so that'll be covered in the spiritual life lecture. But the important part is also in that same letter, Paul says, do not what? Forbid. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. So I have a biblical mandate from the Apostle Paul to not forbid it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Remember it. It's great. <laughs> Anybody, any other questions? It's okay, questions are good. Yes. So, friend, right? So, sorry. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so that's what the beautiful the beautiful part about it is remember we don't do this. We don't say, it must be this way. Because it's what? It's more. So when I, he's going he's gonna to spill your pitcher. And it's, you know, it's going to get everywhere. And that, that's the whole idea. You know why? Do you know why in the Bible oil is equated with the Holy Spirit? There's two reasons. Number one for the oil is, when, have you ever spilled oil? Eddie Fernandez spilled an oil in the back of the Christadia like three years ago. It is still everywhere. He spilled like a jug. It is in everything. The whole Christadia smells like oil. Three years ago, it's everywhere. It got into everything. It soaked into every fabric and every crescent. It cre uh, crevice of the Christadia. That's hard to say. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? I got tongue tied. <laughs> Just kidding. This is a joke. <laughs> But it gets into everything. That's the idea in the Old Testament is that when, you know, the, when, the, when they would be anointed, 
you know, when they would be full of the Spirit of God, that sevenfold Spirit we talked about, it gets into everything. It permeates into everything. And then what? And then the other, the other symbol of, of the Spirit in the Old Testament, besides the oil, is what? The flame. This incredible analogy of oil and flame. That the fire of God is also a symbol of the Holy Spirit. That, that the fire of God can burn in your heart. And He sets His ministers as flames of fire. For our God is a consuming fire. And Jesus tells this very scary, scary parable of ten virgins. And five of them had flame and oil. And five of them had not. And some of them came knocking. And they didn't get in. Questions? Yeah, Cotty. Um, so what happens if someone is filled with the Spirit and sometimes they walk with the Lord and later on in life they walk away from the Lord and they say, I beat my body? Well, that's a good question. The Apostle Paul says, I beat my body into submission that I myself will not be disqualified. <laughs> that's the Apostle Paul. I read this morning, I was like, oh God, I don't want to be disqualified. If he was worried about it, I think we should be worried about it. It says, do not shipwreck your faith. Don't be disqualified. Bring yourself into subjection. Jesus says, watch seven times. Watch. Watch. Be on guard. Be on guard. Be on guard. You know what I'm saying? We should be on guard. If you're worried about that, read 2 Peter. It's terrifying. But that'll help you stay on guard. Read Jude. Stay on guard. You know what I mean? Like... And, I, you know, if you take a little ember out of a fire, sometimes what happens to that ember? It could start another fire or it could go out. So if, you know, some people, yeah, you know, some, what, they might say, yeah, whatever, you know, but, oh, man, they won't be saying that at the judgment. The Bible says every mouth is stopped. Yeah, that's the terrifying part about it. Yeah. So when you're worshiping and you're trying to, to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, I mean, uh, how do you know if you're just saying a bunch of gibberish or if you're just supposed to be more baptized? Good question. You all want to hear about Daniel's story? <laughs> the Daniel story is so funny. I love Daniel because he's the only honest one among us. Daniel was in a coffee shop in the 60s, and he had a whole bunch of these Christians, and he loved Jesus, but he didn't. Daniel was, you know, eighth grade dropout. And uh, he was just like, I, I love God, and, you know, and they were like, well, you need the Holy Spirit. And he goes, I do, I do. <laughs> you know, Daniel is so humble. He's like, well, you need to speak in tongues. He's like, I do, I do. And then, uh, you know, so they all got around, and they laid hands on him in the middle of this coffee shop, and, they, and, he, and he was just like, I don't know what's going on. I'll just do what they do. But you know what? The one thing he says, I did it in faith. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. Right, he didn't know anything about anything, but he got the essential requirement. Have faith. And remember what Dr. Tozer said. We said it earlier. That the mo most important thing in the steps of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to believe that God will. Remember Hebrews eleven six, 6. Right? Like Hebrews 11, 6. For without faith it is impossible. Is it? Without faith it is impossible to please God. It's Johnny's favorite verse. Must we realize that he is and that he is a rewarder of what? Those that diligently seek him. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find.